Hello, my name is Mohamed Noor, and I'd like to go over a couple of very basic concepts from statistics and probability. Now, the reason I like to go into these is that I found some students in my classes, both my on-campus classes and my online classes, sometimes have not had any background in statistics, so I'd like to catch them up on some of the issues that will come up, specifically what is the purpose of statistics and what are some of the issues that can come up in trying to implement them. Now, the goal of most statistics is to test a hypothesis. So, for example, I may have a hypothesis that my wife is not home. So I could test that hypothesis by calling home. Now, it's possible there will be no answer, in which case the observation could be explained by the hypothesis. My observation being that I called home, my wife didn't answer. Therefore, it's possible she's not home. Now, that does not necessarily mean the hypothesis is true. It could be she was in the shower. It could be she just didn't feel like answering the phone. Alternatively, you could reject the hypothesis, which is to say that the observations are very unlikely to be explained by the hypothesis. In that case, for example, if I was to call home, and my wife answers the phone on the home phone, it is very unlikely that she is not home. Right? That would be very improbable. We try to determine a probability, and this is the famous p-value that you often see in, in scientific papers or even in the media. So the p-value, which just stands for probability, is essentially if the hypothesis and its assumptions are actually true, what is the probability you get the observed results? Okay, What is the probability you get the observed results? So if I was to call home and my wife doesn't answer, does that mean there's zero chance she's home? Does that mean there's 10% chance she's home, 50% chance, etc.? The simplest way of thinking about this is in the context of a coin toss. So we have here a little uh, stuffed zonkey who has apparently tossed two coins. This one has heads. Heads is the, the face showing uh, on the coin. Or tails is the other side of the coin. Okay. So the hypothesis that we typically would test with this is that half the time when you flip a coin in the air and it lands on the ground, it'll be heads. Half the time it'll be tails. The assumption then is that the coin is fair. That it's not weighted such that it preferentially goes to heads or preferentially goes to tails. And you have some set of observed results. You flip the coin, say, 10 times, and you have you know, a set of observations. So let's give, let me give you a couple of examples. Let's imagine you toss the coin two times, and you got one head, one tail. Is that consistent with the hypothesis that you know, the coin is fair, and half the time you get heads, and half the time you get tails? Certainly yes, because exactly half the time you got heads, and half the time you got tails in this example. Well, let me give you a different example. What if you flipped a coin a thousand times, and got all heads and no tails. That would be very inconsistent with that hypothesis. In fact, you would be very convinced that the coin was either weighted or only had two heads on it, right? that it was not doing half the time heads and half the time tails. So in this case, you would reject that, that hypothesis of uh, an, a fair coin. Well, what about this one? But what if you toss the coin twice and get heads both times? Hmm. Well, at that point, it does not exactly fit your hypothesis of getting half heads and half tails, 50% probability. On the other hand, you only did two coin tosses. So that's not very compelling, right? So what we can do to figure out the exact probability, given the hypothesis of half the time heads, half the time tails, of getting this observation, is we look at the individual probabilities. So what's the probability of getting heads in one coin toss? Okay, With the hypothesis you have, that probability would be one half. What's the probability of getting heads in the second coin toss? Now it's exactly the same. These two are not dependent upon each other. If you have heads the first time, it doesn't change your odds of getting heads the second time. So what we do then is we make a combined probability. So we just say the probability of each part of it. So the probability of two heads is the probability of getting heads the first time and the probability of getting heads the second time. So it'd be one half times one half, or it'd be one fourth. So there's a pretty high likelihood you actually could get two heads, as many of you have probably observed. Okay? Now, this comes to that concept of joint probabilities. If you have two independent events, meaning that the outcome of the first event is complete, has nothing to do with the outcome of the second event, it doesn't change the likelihood of the second event, then the probability of these two events is the product, so times multiply, of the probability of the event one times the probability of event two. Okay, so that's what we just did. So probably event one was one half, probably event two is the second half. Now importantly, now they are truly independent. So if you get two heads, what's the probability that on your next coin flip it'll be tails? It's still one half. 
there's this thing called gambler's fallacy that people feel like if you toss the coin twice or three times and get heads, oh, next time it's for sure going to be tails. Completely untrue. The probability for the next flip is exactly the same as the probability for the previous flips. Okay? So how do we apply this probability? So we come up with some probability. Let's say we have something like, you know, one-eighth or something like that. How do we decide whether that is good enough to reject the hypothesis or whether it's, eh, okay, it still could be consistent with the hypothesis? Well, traditionally, we reject hypotheses when the probability is less than 5%. So it's at 5% or less. So again, this is the chance that the hypothesis could explain the observed results. So if there's only a 5% chance or less than 5% chance, especially if say it's a 1% chance or 0.1% chance, then there's a high probability that your hypothesis is incorrect in some way. Now I should stress, and this is going to be important for the next part of what I just say, this 5% cutoff is totally arbitrary. If something has a probability of 6%, it doesn't mean, oh, that means that that one's true. Whereas something has 4%, oh, that one's not true. This is just an arbitrary convention, and that's very important to remember that. The other thing is that this 5% cutoff does not work when you have multiple tests of the same hypothesis. Now you may be wondering, why is that? Well, let me show you an example. So I don't know how to pronounce this word, but this is the word for a solid that has 100 sides. And we have down here a 100-sided die, you know, it's a one uh, dice. So let's say that we want to test if this was fair. If we, if we assume it's fair, then the probability of any individual number is going to be 1 in 100. So, for example, the probability of rolling a 33, I just picked that number arbitrarily, would be 1%. Okay? So that's very unlikely that if somebody just rolls the dice, you're going to get a 33. Very, very improbable. Now, let's say you hand somebody this die, and they roll it, and they get a 33. Right off the bat. Well, by the convention I just told you, you would reject that this die is fair, right? Because the probability of getting it was only 1%, and it happened in one throw. So, okay, maybe it is unfair. Now, let me change it around. Let's say 100 people roll this die. What's the probability that at least one of them gets the 33? Well, this is kind of an interesting thing. So, if you do that, this is the formula you would actually use to figure that out. It's uh, 1 minus 1 over 100 to the n, which is the number of rolls power. So 1 minus that. The probability of your getting uh, at least 133, if 100 people roll the dice, is 0.63, or 63%. So it's a very high likelihood if 100 people roll the dice that somebody will get a 33. Now, this is illustrative of a problem that happens with a lot of genetic testing. That when people try to look to see if alleles in a gene are associated with the disease, they often don't test one gene, but they test many, 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 many genes, right? So again, what they do is they look for a difference in abundance of alleles at a gene in the pool of people who have the disease versus the pool of people who don't have the disease. And there's some probability then, just by chance, that you would have this big difference where the diseased people tend to have you know, a T nucleotide at a particular site, whereas the undiseased people tend to have a G nucleotide at that same site. And you can get an associated p-value for that. Now, if you got a p-value for that and that p-value was 0.05, you'd say, okay, it's very unlikely you'd see this difference. And this p equals 0.05 cutoff may be okay if you're just testing alleles at one gene. But if you're testing thousands of genes, the odds that at least one or at least a subset of them will have such a difference is very high. It's the same thing with you know rolling that die a bunch of times. So this is the problem of multiple comparisons. Okay, That if you repeatedly test a hypothesis over and over, the unlikely result becomes quite likely. So how do you fix this? Well, statistically, there's two things you can do. One is you can adjust the cutoff for rejecting the hypothesis. Say, I'm not going to use p equals 0.05 anymore. I'm going to use p equals 1 times 10 to the minus 6th, or some, you know, some very, very low number. There are a lot of corrections. So one famous one is called the Bonferroni correction that a lot of people use. The other thing is you could use a completely different statistical approach, not the, not the kind that I've talked about here, but something that has a false discovery rate, and you try to estimate how often you would get the, a false answer. So this just gives you some examples of how these kinds of things are addressed. But to recap the points I've made here, First, this p-value is the probability you would get the observed result under the hypothesis. And if that, if that probability is high, it doesn't mean the hypothesis is true, it just means it could be right. 
If the probability is very low, we tend to reject the hypothesis. Now we use this 0.05 as a cutoff, but it's an arbitrary cutoff. The other thing we do is we multiply probabilities to get a joint probability of independent events. It's very important they have to be independent. It has to be that probability of, at, at gene one is completely independent of gene two, or coin flip one is independent of coin flip two. And if you're doing multiple comparisons, there is an issue there that you can artificially get the unlikely result just because you've done so many tests and therefore you can't necessarily trust the, the standard cutoff of 0.05 if you're doing that. Well, I hope that was helpful. Thanks for your time.